your assessment of the role technology is playing in the Israeli response to the weekend's events? Well, first of all, Ed, thank you, thank you for having me uh, on the show. Um, the, 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 the events started on uh, Saturday morning uh, with this ISIS-type massacre of, of innocent civilians, now to only get north of 1,200 people, have really challenged Israel. Uh, but, you know, if to paraphrase from the American uh, national anthem, Israel is, is the, the land of the free and home of the resilient. And I'm sure that with technology, um, we're going to persevere, we're going to win this one and continue to contribute uh, to the way in which global uh, uh, humanity is dealing with its, with its top challenges through technology. Um, this is not just Israel's technology and defense. Israel's a powerhouse of technology in solving and tackling some of the biggest problems facing humanity. And, and our ecosystem is, is uh, committed uh, to that, to its role uh, within this global context. Yonatan, one area of the technology discussion is in intelligence and data. And, and, a, and a debate that's taken place on the show this week was about the preparedness of Israeli intelligence forces. Um, we had one academic on the show who said it wasn't a lack of intelligence, but simply a lack of uh, imagination at the scale of what Hamas would, would be able to have done. Please reflect on your experience as, as the chief technology officer of the country and, and share with our audience what you know Israel had in place uh, in recent times in the, in the areas of defense intelligence. Well, I think that, I think you're totally right, Ed. Uh, spot on. Uh, Israel has deployed numerous technologies. I think the core one, as you've discussed with Oliver, was was um, Iron Dome. I remember in May 2009, uh, I was on President Paris's team as we came to meet President Obama in the White House right after the inauguration. Technology was a big part of that. Defense technology was a big part of that. But I think you are you are totally right about the uh, limitations. Of Intelligence uh, technologies as to the imagination gap. The intelligence technologies provide us with data. Uh, they provide us with uh, signals, if you will, but it is at the end of the day, the human uh, interpreter that needs to put in the signal and noise ratio and to figure out what's the plausible uh, uh, scenario. If you will, I would like to uh, equate that with what happened in 9-11. America, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, we know that from the investigative committee post 9-11 has had quite a, a significant degree of intelligence, uh, but it was about putting those bits and pieces together and anticipating that people would actually go into the cockpit and transform uh, an airliner into a live bomb and you know crush it into, uh, into the, the, the Twin Towers and to other uh, targets within the U.S. So I think you're spot on on that. Uh, you can be a superpower the size of the U.S., you can be a technology superpower the size of Israel and deploy, you know, frontline technologies. But at the end of the day, it's about the ability to, to imagine, you know, what could be that human factor usage of, yes. um, of those signals uh, in a terror context. Jonathan, I would just point out that that viewpoint, that it was a lack of imagination rather than intelligence, was the viewpoint of Professor Charles Freilich of Columbia, a uh, former yeah. intelligence advisor to your country, Israel, not, not my own. We, yeah. We've talked a lot about the sort of hard power, hardware technology response and software response. Let's talk a bit about the industry. You yourself are a startup founder. Is, Israel's economy has deep roots in technology. What is it like right now to operate a startup, a small startup in Israel with what's happening in the country? Well, I think, you know, fun fundamentally, Israel has had a, in, over the last just week, a $10 trillion worth of market cap vote of confidence, in, if you will, between Microsoft, Apple, Google, uh, Amazon, NVIDIA, who all have deployed uh, significant parts of their R&D. Intel has their um, uh, autonomous car brain here in Israel. Uh, Apple runs part of its design of chipsets and semiconductors. So does Intel. Again, uh, Google has a, a, a very uh, profound base of R&D in Israel. They have all Andy Jassy at Amazon, Sundar Pichai, uh, and, and uh, Jensen Huang. The leadership of those companies have um, uh, unequivocally supported Israel and the ecosystem here 
Um, if yes. we add two to three trillion dollars more of support in what what's going on here in the life sciences industry, in the cyberspace industry, I would say that part of what enables our conversation right now and for the viewers at home uh, from the moment they woke up this morning until right now, they would have probably used an Israeli technology. So we continue to perform. We continue to uh, develop. And part of that is, you know, how do we manage the emergency situation here in Israel and then allocating the empathy yes. to our workforce, to the broader community. But how do we remain committed to solving humanity's greatest challenges, even when we're under war, under attack of thousands of rockets, in this insidious attack, uh, kind of ISIS class from, from last Saturday? That's what we have to balance, and that's what we're committed to do.